That little outburst is why I love our church. Kids feel like this is like their living room. And it's not just the preacher's kids. I've seen some of yours to it as well, who after service take off running through this place. And I was told as a kid, you don't run in church. But then I went to some churches where people were running during the song. So I, I don't know what the real rules are. But uh, I just know that one of the things I love about our church, the Church of Wood Force, is that it really is supposed to feel like you're coming home when you show up on a Sunday. It's supposed to feel like you're kind of walking into your own living room. Uh, and that you're in a place where you can experience the love of God and the people around you. You experience the love of God uh, as he shows up in the place just to be with you. And it can be like comfortable and casual, kind of like when you leave here and you kick off your shoes to go sit on the couch or the recliner to rest a little bit for the day. It really is kind of the environment we're trying to create here, uh, a place of comfort and a place where you can truly just come and spend some time with the Lord. It's really all we're doing here. It's intended to be a place of rest. And boy, do we need rest. In fact, that's the theme of the sermon today. And I was talking to my, my middle son. We were in the car driving yesterday. And I said, I need to get back to the church so I can kind of wrap up the sermon, get it finished, let it land. I've got all the stuff. I'm just waiting for it all to land in a, in a way that makes sense. And you'll get to be the judge if it ever did. But I said, you know, we're talking about rest and Sabbath. So I guess I could just get up at the beginning of the sermon and say, hey, we're talking about Sabbath, the importance of naps. So for the next 23 minutes and 28 seconds, I want to invite you just to close your eyes and take a nap. He said that'd be kind of like cheating. You got you to have to preach. They're expecting a sermon. If you do that, you might lose your job. So I'm going to still uh, offer you a word, but I will offer it with the conditions that there are a lot of stories in the Bible where Jesus slept. And there's stories in the Bible where God showed up to people who were sleeping. And so if, again, if, if today's gift I can give you is a place of rest, I'm going to be talking about rest, but if you need to experience it, you don't need to hear more about it, then just rest. It's okay. It's kind of what we're doing here, resting in the, in the presence of the Lord. We're at the end of a book series. We went through the whole summer with this book in one hand and the Word of God in the other. The book's called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. The author was trying to, and it really has has accomplished this with me, to point out some places in our normal, everyday, ordinary lives that are a lot like the things we do when we're in worship, and trying to help us find ways to connect the things that we would do in worship with the things we would do in an everyday life, so that maybe the two lives start to become more like one life. And so she went through in the table of contents, this is the way I'm going to remind us of this whole thing, but we started with waking and how waking up to the knowledge that you are a beloved child of God, kind of like what Raph was trying to point out to us about our identities that you're not the title on your business card first. Your first is what happened to you when the yes of God rang true in your ears. And the yes of God says, you are my child. With you, I'm well pleased. And so we started the series with that in mind, remembering our baptism, remembering that we wake up each day as a messy, sleepy, beloved child of God. No more, no less. That's just who we are. And then we moved through these chapters. We worked, talked about making the bed and the importance of liturgy and ritual and making your bed you should make your bed. You should brush your teeth. That was the next thing. These were all things you really should do. But we were talking about how there are rituals in the life of our church, liturgies of sorts. In our church, we sing a few songs. We say a prayer. We take an offering. You get a sermon bumper. The kids leave, preach. We'll sing a song. Remember, that's our liturgy. Your lives look like that too. They kind of have a rhythm to them, and you have your routines. Those are important. We talked about losing our keys and how sometimes we come into little things that end up being big problems. And the author was trying to remind us not to let little things become big things. Let little things be little things. And when little things become big things, be ready to confess that you don't have it all together, that sin is a real thing in your life. Confess it to yourself and then confess it where it has caused harm to the people around you. That was that chapter. Then we talked about eating leftovers. And it was a communion Sunday. And we talked about all the places where we overlook the nourishment that God is seeking to provide for us. Nourishment like food, no doubt, like I talked about Taco Bell and how it's great if you get black beans instead of that greasy meat. It's super healthy for you as well. But there's also unnoticed and overlooked nourishment that you can find in relationships. If you look for it, you'll find it. God is showing up all day long in the people around us as well, and there's nourishment both to give and to receive in those interactions. So that was the eating leftovers chapter. As we fast forward through the rest of the series, there was fighting with my husband was the title fighting with my wife, fighting with my friends, fighting, just fighting. 
We talked about the importance of when you're in fights, how do you, how do you get beyond this fighting thing? How do you join God in becoming literally shalom, being a source of shalom, helping God's desire for all things to come together and to be at peace? How do you participate in that? Then we talked about checking our email and the blessing and the sending. We talked about sitting in traffic and how much we love that and how there's liturgical time even in an unhurried God. There's times to be fast and times to be slow and it's just the rhythm of our lives. Sitting in traffic might even be a gift if we receive it as such. And then they talked about calling a friend and, and drinking tea. And this was, these two chapters were really about the importance of our community. And if you've been worshiping from a distance, there, there are still folks who, who have not felt safe yet to come back to the building. They're resisting crowds for one reason or another. And especially with the resurgence of a variant, it makes sense that some people would not feel safe in community. But what all of us have recognized is that being in community is something we've so longed for and so missed And there's something that happens when we gather together to worship. There's something that happens when we gather together and we eat a meal with other human beings at the same table. And it's something we need. We're created for this, created for community. Even God himself was was community, uh, three in one. So that works us through our our table of contents. And that's, that's where we've been. Now, the last chapter is about Sabbath. As I said, it's about rest. And it makes sense that we talk about Sabbath on the last chapter in the last Sunday of our series. We're about to kick off next Sunday is Back to School Sunday. Maybe you're unaware of this, but your kids are going back to school this week. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing when those kids go back and torture their teachers instead of their parents. But they're going to go to school, and we're going to have a new rhythm, and there's going to be Friday night football, and there's going to be Friday night band, and there's going to be Saturday mornings that you wish didn't start as early for your kid to go and do their thing. Life gets kind of crazy if you're a family who's still in the season of life where there's active kids involved. Some of you, next Sunday is just like last Sunday. You're retired, and hey, it's life. It's good stuff. Rest. But we want to talk about Sabbath today, and we get Sabbath first in the Scriptures, Maybe you remember at the very beginning of the Bible, in the very first chapter, we get this story of creation. It's how we as Christians, as believers, believe that the world got started. And so uh, I want to remind you that at the end of day six, so there's seven days of creation, really six of creating, one of rest, but there's this introduction to Sabbath that happens here at the beginning. Chapter one, verse 31 is the sixth day, and it ends this way. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. It was us. It was the day that he created you and me, humanity, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and it was the sixth day. I want you to notice right there that it was morning, and it was evening, the sixth day. You see, in the Jewish tradition, the day begins at sundown, not at sunup. So from the very get-go in creation, there's this thought that we start in the dark, And then we come alive in the light. There's this priority, this primacy that's placed on rest before you go. Not rest to recover from where you've been. It's sort of built into the rhythm of the early Jewish faith. Continue in chapter 2, though. Thus, the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now here's the deal. God is an infinite being. God was not tired. This creation thing had not worn him out so much that he had to sit in some proverbial rocking chair and take a break. No, most theologians look at this and think that God, after having created for six days, was kind of like a mountain climber who has climbed for six days, gets to the top of the mountain, and then just stops and takes in, just looks at all that he's done. Boy, isn't this good. And them, they're very good. This is going to be great. You know, we'll see pleasure in God's voice and across his face. This is so good. I'm so glad I created all this created them to enjoy it with me. That was the garden. It was the perfect time, the perfect place. But here's the deal. We are not God. We are finite. And we know that after that six days of climbing, we get to the mountain peak maybe, and we get to look at all the great stuff that's there, and then we have to go back to work. And as finite beings, we wrestle with rest. In fact, my friend, Nate Stuckey, who lives up in, in New Jersey, wrote a book called Wrestling with Rest. He's a Mennonite, 
And he approaches faith a little differently than we do. They really prioritize rest and the rhythms of the earth and farming and things. And so he actually got Princeton Seminary to help him create a program called the Farminary. So it's seminary plus farming in one degree. It's a really cool concept. So he'll take seminarians who can take classes in his program and takes them out to the farm and shows them why so many of the parables of Jesus actually were built in this agrarian culture of watching things grow, planting and growing and planting and growing. It's a neat deal. Anyway, in his book, he points out something that I had never really noticed before. That in this rhythm of creation, that God creates us on the sixth day and then rest. So if you think about it, the first day that humanity was alive, it was a day of rest. Our first day was the rest day, the resting day of day seven. And so from the very get-go again in the scriptures, it was evening and then it was morning. We begin with rest and then we go and love and serve the Lord. And we were created to then step into a day of rest. It wasn't like God created us and said, now get to work. God created us and said, now then, let's spend a little time together. Let me show you all of this creation that I've made for you. Let me show you these animals that you're going to be tending, these, this plant life that you're going to be enjoying. Let's, let's just spend some time together. And things went afoul and things went amok. We were remembering, though, that even Jesus had to remind the people in the New Testament in Mark chapter 2 that the Sabbath was literally made for us. We weren't made for the Sabbath like it was a new rule, one of many rules that we were supposed to follow, though it does become a rule, and I'll tell you about it. But at its core, God had created Sabbath for us. God knew we would need to rest. He knew that there'd come a time when we would resist it for all sorts of reasons. So why do we avoid it? Why do we resist this rest that God created for us? Because we're busy. Like the country song, was it Brooks and Dunn who sang, I'm in a hurry to get things done. I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I got to really do is live and die, and I'm in a hurry. I don't know why. I know why. Because somewhere along the way, you bought in to you are what you do. You are what others think of you. You are how effective you are, how successful you are, how busy you are. That's who you are. And if the world that we live in values us for being busy and, and successful and make as much as you can, get all you can out of this life before it's gone, if that's the, the approach, then of course you're not going to take a nap. I mean, who gets to take naps anymore? Pre-K and kindergartners do. They get to take naps. Retired people do. They get to take naps. But the rest of us? Somewhere along the way, they got rid of naps. I don't know why. I like naps. I think middle school and high school kids at, at school, if they could just like have fourth periods nap, I'd sign up for that elective every semester. <laughs> right? And we could do it right after lunch when you're sleeping through fifth period English anyway. <laughs> just let's have a nap. Let's have a rest. Let's just let them do what their bodies are telling them they need to do. But see, these kids, they're watching us. They're watching how adults live, and they, they're listening to what adults say, and they think, well, I gotta do what they do and hear what they say. Despite the fact that I've heard teenagers actually say, I don't wanna grow up and become an adult because I've watched what, what it looks like, it's not all that exciting. I think I'll stay young as long as I can. Adults, we buy things like five-hour energy drinks. We consume Monster by the six-pack, don't mess with me till I've had my coffee is the mentality that we speak. We're letting our young people know that if you're tired, drink something that'll make you go again. You gotta go again. First up, last to bed, go at it again. And some of y'all are caught in that trap and there's people watching. I know that they're watching. I was uh, with a couple high school kids this past week a couple of high school guys, I was standing watching my wife's volleyball scrimmage. And these couple of boys come in that I know, and I small talk with them a little bit. And, hey, what are you guys doing here? They go, girls. <laughs> volleyball outfits. <laughs> I'm here. That's my girlfriend. <laughs> it, well, all right, which one's yours? Well, it's not official yet, but eh, kind of like her. Okay, cool. So we're talking about all kinds of things. And as we talk, this interesting thing comes. One of them, um, I can't say a whole lot about him because my son's here and he's friends with him and it could get out of here. But this kid says, here's what I've learned 
from the adult men that are in my life. The most successful ones are the ones that wake up the earliest and get to work. Get up as early as you can, get as much done as you can, you'll be a success. You'll be the most successful. He was saying kind of what some of us have heard before. The early bird gets the worm. I've heard that before. But have you also heard that in Matthew chapter six, when Jesus is giving his biggest first long sermon, that he says something about birds? And it's like at all, anything about the bird getting the, the first one up gets the worm. Instead, he says, look at the birds of the air. They don't have storehouses or barns to store up food for themselves, and yet I feed them. He talks about taking care of birds, giving them all that they need because they don't have to be the first one to the worm. There'll be enough worms. He doesn't say that specifically, but I believe he's meaning it. Instead, he says, look at the way I care for the birds. Don't you think I care about you more than I care about birds? If I'm gonna make sure they have enough to eat, even if they're the second one to the worm, don't you think that I'll take care of you too? That's what Jesus says. I think Jesus would have had any time for that early bird gets the worm kind of talk. I think Jesus would have said, if getting to the worm first means stealing time from being with me, you got it wrong. Spend some time with me, I'll take care of the worm. Come on, hang with me. So we find uh, this uh, quote here in the book that I want to, the author kind of picks up on this whole idea of Sabbath and, and our lack of willingness to, uh, to follow it. She talks in a, in a pretty interesting way, in a convicting way about the culture that we live in and the culture that we've helped create. Kind of goes along with what that high school kid was saying. She says it this way. She says, a few years ago, a Sprint commercial proclaimed defiantly, I want, no, I have the right to be unlimited. This is the message we receive from our culture, no limits. Nothing should stop you, slow you down, or limit your freedom. Not even human embodiment. You can be unlimited, and if you're not, someone's to blame. We believe that we need better technology. We need better efficiency and better organization so we can exist as people unbridled from creaturely limits. We can be boundless, competent, and utterly self-determining. And then she throws out some stats at us. Listen to these, man. According to data from the National Health Interview Survey, nearly 30%, one in three, of adults average less than six hours of sleep a night. One in three. Less than six hours. It's recommended physiologically, that we spend seven to eight hours as adults asleep, just for our bodies. She goes on, only about 30% of high school students reported getting at least eight hours of sleep on an average school night, though they really need about 10. Do you imagine, middle school, high school kids, if y'all were getting 10 hours of sleep? Can't do anything about the time that school starts, but we can do a lot about the time we turn our phones off and put them on the nightstand to get that rest. What that friend is celebrating or what that friend's lying about, pretending that really happened to them, really doesn't matter. You can go to sleep. In one national study, over 7% of people between 25 and 35 admitted to actually nodding off while driving in the past month. Now, 7% doesn't sound that high, but I go by at least 100 cars a day, and to think that seven of them are falling asleep at the wheel... Makes me just a tad nervous. In 2013, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention declared that insufficient sleep is a public health problem. Now, these, these surveys are not just about you. I mean, they're not just like business people and teachers and, and moms who work from home and all of these business type people, lawyers. They include pastors in it as well, people like me. And a few pages later, she says a few things about people like me. She says this, in a historical looking back, she says, Wesleyan ministers in early evangelicalism, so that's like people from the Methodist, right, Wesleyan people, they were often called circuit riders. These were people who were on horseback, riding from church to church, community to community, trying to spread the gospel, express good news. And they were expected to work between 90 and 100 hours a week. 
90 and 100 hours a week. I don't know who was expecting that. Probably the bosses that were waiting to hear about how many salvations and baptisms and services that they had led. So many early ministers collapsed under sheer exhaustion that the church created what they called a worn out minister's fund. Where's that fund? <laughs> I have to dip in on that. I, mean, I can take a break. People pay me to do nothing. All right, let's do that. Note that the rash of worn out ministers did not cause the movement to rethink its tactics. They didn't say pastors quit working so much. Instead, <laughs> the ideas of rest and sustainable Christian life, uh uh-uh. they started a fund, another activist thing to do, something to rally around. Pastors are tired. And this hasn't gone away. Now, I'm not a circuit rider and I'm not on horseback riding from town to town. Thankfully, I walk three blocks or drive three blocks. I get here. I can get here before my check your seatbelt thing starts to ding. And I'm here because I'm wearing my seatbelt. That's why it doesn't ding. (laughs) But I get right here in a nice, comfortable place to work. I'm not running all over the place. And in full admission, I can't remember the last time I worked 90 to 100 hours in a week. I'm not willing. I'm not going to do it because in recent years, there was this thing called the Bethany Fellows. I was never invited to be a part of it. I had already been in ministry too long to be invited. But they had this thing where ministers who were in their first five years of ministry were invited to this Bethany Fellows deal to go away multiple times a year for retreat, to rest, to recover, to recoup. And I can remember thinking back in my early days, they've only been at it for five years. What do they know about exhaustion? These are new, new kids just getting out of seminary. They can't be tired yet. But they were onto something because the Lilly Foundation had given all this money to this program because what they found was there was this horrible, gross percentage, high percentage of pastors who never made it five years. They became so exhausted in their first five years that they just fell out of it altogether. So it's a thing. It's a thing for you, and it's a thing for me. We need rest. We need rest. I've got three reasons why we need rest. I'm going to give them to you real quick. We need to rest because God commands it. You may not realize this, but that idea of Sabbath was not a suggestion. It was a command. It's right here in the Bible. Exodus chapter 20. There's three commandments, and then there's this one. This one reads, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shouldn't do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male and female slave, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. It's a command, not a suggestion. And it's so interesting that even amongst the pastoral team, when I first arrived here, we're a pretty high-functioning church, by the way, 14,000 plus members across our two campuses, Got a lot of pastors, a lot of staff, and there was a culture when I got here, and it jumped at me immediately. When someone would say, hey, can we meet on Friday? And I'd go, I can't, can't make it. That's my day off. And they respond with, you take your day off? You don't? Oh, come on, Brent. Everybody knows in ministry you don't get a day off. You work seven days a week. I mean, we're flexible. We, we make ourselves available to people. You can't just take a day off. What are you thinking? No, I'm taking my day off. They asked me when I got hired what was going to be my day off. I told them it was going to be Friday and Saturday. So on Friday and Saturday, if you text me, it's not an emergency, I'll respond, let's talk Monday. If it's an emergency, we'll talk. But if it's not, we won't. Because it was a commandment. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't a, hey, if you have time, take a day off. It was, no, take a day off. You were created to rest before you can do. And if you're not rested, you can't do nothing for the people. And so there's times when you reach out. I I may not be as available as you'd like, but I'm going to respond to let you know. I'm here for you. I really am. But 90 to 100 hours a week? Mm -mm. Not happening. Not happening. It's not what God called me to. And and quite honestly, it's not what God called you to either. He called you to rest. To rest in his presence and then to serve out of a place of rest. God commands this. It's a Commandments, the fourth one. And if you haven't noticed lately, if you go and read the list of commandments, it's really interesting. I didn't even realize this really. I knew it was early on, but I didn't remember where it fit. But after the Sabbath is when God then doubles down and says, also, while you're at it, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, 
Don't lie, don't covet your neighbor's stuff. He didn't even address any of that stuff until he says, and remember the Sabbath. Like, no God's before me, rest. Oh, and by the way, also don't murder, all those things. It's really interesting when you think about the order in which God chooses to give us these things. So I wanna go to, a, to the second reason that we need to rest. God commands it in Exodus, commands it. One of the 10. But I think we should also consider resting because Jesus himself did it. God incarnate rested. It's one of the things he did. And if you wanna be like Jesus, you should do what Jesus did. I see plenty of people wearing shirts that say, Jesus drank wine, so do I. <laughs> but how about the shirt that says, Jesus took naps, be like Jesus. Do you remember the time Jesus took a nap? Maybe you've forgotten. Let me remind you of when he took a nap. It's in Mark chapter four. It's actually in Matthew and in Luke as well. And when it happens in all the gospels, we pay a special extra attention to it. But in chapter four of Mark, it goes like this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along as he was in the boat. There were other boats. And while they were out, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, so it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And, and then he got up and he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And then he says to the disciples, why are you so afraid? You still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Interesting thing about this story, we're not gonna go into the matters of faith. We've actually kind of run out of time anyway. There's another sermon about the faith of these people who found Jesus sleeping in their boat and the fear that they had. But there were a couple of things about this story in Mark's version that were really important to share. One is the very first verse. That day when evening came, don't miss the detail, it was evening. Who doesn't sleep when evening comes? He's supposed to sleep. Get in the boat. It's evening. Let's go to sleep. These other disciples were staying awake. Did he tell them to go row the boat? No. He, it's evening. He's supposed to be resting. And what he proves in this story is that even the Son of God can sleep. He can rest. And we should too. He can calm us and he can calm the wind and the waves all around us. God is in control and has a lot of power. And Jesus, who had all of this authority, decided he could even take a nap. So if the, the one who has power and control over everything can rest, maybe we could too. Let me hustle through the end. This resting thing is a spiritual thing. Some might say that those who refuse to rest refuse to trust God. We've got to be awake. We've got to go and do. We've got to be effective and productive. And if we're not, God will be disappointed and God needs us. Go back to the beginning of the sermon. God is infinite. We are finite. God can do it without us. Some would even say that when we go to sleep, God does his best work. It's a spiritual thing. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And an interesting thing about that short little teaching, and I want to close in this way. I was talking to one of our church members this past week who's caring for a loved one, and uh, the loved one's health has been really a, a struggle. And this church member calls me, and, and we visit, and, and I heard her say this. Brent, I am so exhausted. I am so exhausted, I don't even know what or how to pray anymore. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. She had, and I think we do, allow ourselves to become so overwhelmed by trying to do it all by ourselves that we miss the one who says, I got this. I got this. Give me the thing that you're trying to work on. Give me the person you're praying for. Let me take care of them while you get a nap. The thing you want for them, that burden you carry for them, I carry that burden too. So let me carry it with you. It's like Jesus is saying, this, this yoke that he says, take my yoke upon you, 
Super important thing about that yoke. He's not saying, hey, I've been carrying the weight of the world for a long, long time. Hey, could you come on over here so I can put it on you instead? I'm a little tired of pulling my weight and pulling yours too. Why don't you go and do it yourself? It's not the way it works because the yoke had room for two. It's what Jesus is really saying. He's saying, hey, come on over here. That thing that you're trying to carry all by yourself, come on over here. I'm carrying it. Get under the yoke with me and let's do this thing together. Let me help you pull this thing along. And in case we might get confused about which direction we're supposed to be carrying this thing, why don't you just hang tight with me? Lock yourself in with me because I know the way. In fact, maybe you hadn't heard, but I am the way. Why don't you just link yourself up here beside me and let's carry this weight together. Come to me, you who are weary. You who are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Let's walk side by side and you will have rest for your soul. Sometimes I know this happens to me and I don't know if it happens to you, but I I get so caught up in the thing I'm doing that I start to really think that unless I do it, it'll never happen. That the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And in just these three verses, Jesus reminds us, nope, The weight of the world's on my shoulders. The sin of the world is on my shoulders. I got this. And then invites us to rest. To rest easy knowing he's got us. He's got this all under control. If you like me have forgotten that, let me pray for you as I pray for me so we might remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. God, we are human doings. You call us human beings and you created us to be, simply be in your presence. You created us from the very get-go to to live in a place of rest. You knew that we would need rest, time with you. We would need you to help us carry burdens so that we could experience true peace. We read it in the book. We hear preachers proclaim it. Some of us just haven't found it to be true. God, this morning, I'm believing that we would find it to be true if we would test you with it, if we would trust you with it, if we would consider maybe taking you at your word, that if we would just come on over here beside you and put the yoke that you carry on our shoulders, that together we can do all things. Kind of reminds me of something you said elsewhere, that that with you, we can do all things, and apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, God, for those of us who have been trying to do it apart from you, there's our answer why it's not getting done. There's our answer as to why it's so hard to live this life, why it's so hard to accomplish all that we're seeking to accomplish, why this world is so overwhelming to us. But connected to you, God, can do all things. Connected to you, the worry and the things that make us burdened become things that you carry and feel a little bit lighter as a result. So God, for my friends in the room who are feeling completely overwhelmed, not only overwhelmed by the task, the task of being a, a worker, or the task of being a mom or a dad or a sibling or a caregiver, the weight of being an employee, God, that you would invite them to give you a part of the job, that, that we would be invited to take you into our everyday, ordinary lives and let you do what you do. And for others of us, God, it's the weight, the burden is not work-related. It's not spending too much time doing stuff. It's spending too much time worrying about stuff spending a lot of time in our grief and in our sadness and in our questioning. And so God, for us, I pray that you would draw near. You would allow us to sit in your presence, to rest, to rest in your goodness, to allow you to bring peace and comfort and hope back into our souls. 
We quit trying to do things to make things feel better. We would stop doing the things that distract and just lean in on you and your love for us. And God, I pray. I pray that when we find you near, we find evidence that if we would just welcome you into things, if we would just get your yoke on us, uh, that life would be much more that life to the full that you promised. That joy and hope would, would become our new anthem. And energy would, re- would just come back into us. Be ready to love and to serve you. God, bring your sense of peace and your comfort to us. Help us to stand again. In Jesus' name, amen.